Uh, I'll make sure you get copies of this. Thank you very much. Uh, and somebody will make these, make a note to me about the promises I make about some material because I'm going to try and do a deep dive. Uh, and if you're recording this, please don't tell my boss. The most interesting job is the one in Chile, where I have absolutely no formal design training. And I put the word design in entrepreneurship education because what I see going on in design schools is exactly the process I think entrepreneurs should be using. Um, and I'm fascinated by this. So it's the one gig that I get more pings and more corporate work from because design is a word that companies don't understand. And I don't like to use the word entrepreneurship a lot because I work with a lot of, co of big companies and big companies don't want to hear the word entrepreneurship, but what they do need is creativity. I'm going to come back to that. Um, I've been in this game 25 years. And when I started teaching, and this is look familiar, this is your very typical business MBA class. Chevron left to right. Light bulb moment to write a plan to raise money and exit. That's what I was teaching in 10-week formats in London. Uh, and now I don't teach this at all. At all. I've morphed into something that is, I think, far more impactful than this. Partly because, and I like to use this kind of provo provocation, I think there's a lot of wily coyotes in companies and in universities. Lots of professors who have lots of gadgets to try and solve a problem. And this is actually aging me. That was shown on Saturday morning when I wanted to sleep in and my parents wanted, or my parents wanted to sleep in and I, I had to entertain myself. This was a solution to that problem. And you realize that the coyote never actually caught the roadrunner. Never. Uh, but he had lots of fancy gadgets. And our research labs have lots of these fancy gadgets. And in Finland, we get lots of prototyping money to do fancy gadgets. But many times, these gadgets never hit the hands of customers. And particularly, never hit the hands of customers in the early design phase. More about that a bit later. There's always a plan. This, by the way, is a great plan. This is a great plan. In fact, one of the things I teach my students, and, it's, and I, I don't mean to level this as a big criticism. A lot of my colleagues dump volumes of paper to students and then expect them to regurgitate volumes of papers back again. When in fact I think a real skill is to have the depth of knowledge to read through those papers and put them back in one paragraph. And I, I, most of my work with students is giving them robust critiques to actually get to the point, to start to manage time, and to start to use visuals. Now, this is actually a rather good visual plan. I, I kind of get the point, and most people say I don't have any design training. I, that's a drawing that I would like, to, I could probably do. My wife is far more talented. And you kind of get the point that if the bomb hits the X in the spot, the coyote's going to have dinner. But every plan has a flaw. More about that in a minute. You, have, you need to know something about bombs. You need to make sure that at the X marks a spot, the roadrunner doesn't get blown to smithereens. You need to know something about trajectories, but every plan has a flaw. I still don't understand how the coyote flies. And plan A never works. And yet there's a lot of this kind of plan A thinking going on in large organizations, including universities. But this is not the way that entrepreneurs operate. Coyote had money. This is off the internet, so it must be true. These are all the solutions that he tried to buy. <laughs> And actually, he's a very good customer, and we were talking about this over lunch. I think the challenge of being an entrepreneurship educator is to find out exactly who the customer is and how do you convince the customer to part with money. The rest of it is adorning. There's no point in talking about IP and raising cash unless you could tell me exactly who the customer is, who the problem holder is, who the budget holder is, and how do you convince these people. Now, this is, in, in Jeffrey Moore's terms, this is a very good pioneer customer. You put lots of solutions in front of him, he doesn't care whether they work or not. And he obviously has some money to spend. And most of my students think that they can do this. Uh, but Harvard's a special network place. And the stars and the constellations have to align, and it can happen. But the probability that the person sitting inside my classroom is one of these is infinitesimally small. 
And, but they're fascinated, and they don't realize, actually, that my boss, the president, does not like to hear the word dropout. <laughs> my president wants my students to graduate. And I'll put hand over heart, I think our first mission is not to educate people about starting new businesses. <coughs> it's actually to be a good engineer, get fundamentals, curiosity, learn about domains, and then the confidence and skills to try and exploit those domains. And a lot of what we're going to talk about happens outside of class, not only in class. And I have a lot of these young entrepreneurs who face this decision. They get so excited about how easy it is to start a business, and they want to quit school. I think that's a bad thing. I just met a 14-year-old Finnish high school student before I came here. He has three businesses. And he actually was in my office and said he wants, he, he doesn't know whether he wants to go to university at all. He thinks it's a waste of time. I, I'm going to have him into my office to try and enlighten him that I think spending some time in a university is actually a very good thing. Uh, I think his parents will probably love me for doing that. And, you know, he's worth 73 billion. That's the effort is to become big, make a lot of money. It can happen, but, you know, people who focus on that are not focused on customers or problem solving and their priorities are misplaced. And we've had this analytical argument. This is an analytic approach to a problem, and it doesn't work. If you approach this task, you are likely setting yourself up for failure. And this is something that most people don't have a tolerance to even talk about. Because my students, I have a problem. They have traveled more, done more, hugely talented, uh, lack attention. They're curious about everything, and many of them have never failed. And when you tell them you're going to fail, <sighs> that's something that's not on their resume and they're not prepared for. And we were talking about this over lunch, that failure is one of these necessary things that's going to happen in this entrepreneurial path, and we know very little about it in research purposes. So analytics, I remember that some guy at London Business School said to me, I don't know whether MBA programs are good for entrepreneurs. Because they're so smart, when you see this kind of data, you will find a reason not to do something. And in fact, in his view, an entrepreneur is somebody stupid enough not to know what they're getting themselves into. And it, you know, the dean of the school went, how could you say this? But I think he had a point. Francis Finley had a point. We do a lot of this kind of thinking. I'm in a science department. I've, I'm a business trained guy. This is all about case studies and big data and spotting patterns. And if you were in this person's position, what would you do? This is hypothesis testing. We have professors who are particularly in sciences very good at this. And the best reliability is when you get a theory and the error term is zero. If you are a person that's driven to reduce the error term, you are likely not an entrepreneur. Entrepreneurs like noisy error terms. They have enough information and they want to act because analytical people like reliable solutions. Prove to me something has worked before. And I want you to focus on those words. Prove to me something has worked before. Okay. Now, put your design hat on. A lot of the courses I spend don't even have the word entrepreneurship in them. My first course is called Opportunity Prototyping. The second course is design and innovation in context. The label with design tends to bring out a whole bunch of different students. It's the most interesting class I teach. I do one on startup finance where we're going to talk about exit plans for existing businesses as opposed to the comedy of trying to raise money from a venture capitalist, which is not interesting for somebody in their mid-20s. And I think you can actually train people to be designers. Look at the customer. Teeth bared. Knife and fork, bib, springing to action, and you look at the face of the roadrunner, no fear. There's a lot to infer from this. You can assume he's not a vegan. I look at the bird and say, there's not a lot of meat on this bird. <laughs> and I remember having a conversation with my mother when I was about four, and I said, well, the coyote's obviously got money. Why doesn't he just go out and buy food? Problem is solved. That's what I mean by rapid opportunity prototyping. Problem solution, customer parts with money quickly. If you get a story like that, you're in business. But to get a story down to that kind of thing takes a lot of discipline and effort. 
And she said, no, 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 that's not the case. He might be interested in the chase. He, he put up with a lot of painful experiences. Uh, he may like taking on risk. He might not be interested in the bird at all for food. You never know unless you ask. And I, I spend a lot of time with my students to drop them into the marketplace to have a look at what's going on. We'll talk a bit more about that. I prefer this title. Now, in the title slide, I, this practice-based professorship I have at Alto is not a research professorship. It's a five, it was a five-year termed appointment to do radical stuff. Now, in full declaration, I have been at the university so long, I effectively have a permanent underlying contract, so they can't fire me. That, to me, in my terms, is like tenure, although I'm not a tenure-track position. And it's quite interesting for a guy to be radical, it's good to have the job security that the boss can say, you know, please do some experimentation and prototypes. It's much easier for me to do that than a junior faculty member who's worried about tenure. And it was labeled high growth entrepreneurship. I'm going to come back to this. It's mislabeled. Uh, they're talking right now. The five year term for the appointment has finished. They're busy putting the paperwork together, and I've asked that the second professorship of practice, which they're working on right now, be called Creativity and Innovation. Better describes what I do, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Now, my son just got into business school. I'm very proud. And they had the question as to, you know, why would, you know, what, you're enrolling in this school as a bachelor's degree, and I just happened upon this 2018 World Economic Forum, and is there some interesting data on this slide that strikes you? Young students coming into this university, CSU, which part of the table you look, should be looking at? The left or the right? Yeah. Left, right? I'm coming into an experience. This is rear view thinking. This is forward thinking. What has changed between those two lists? And I'm really struck by it. Creativity has jumped from 10 to 3. Complex problem solving, critical thinking, people management, coordination, creativity. There's an awful lot of the stuff you find in design briefs in the top five. So I'm hitting a hot zone. I hit it rather early, but I'm hitting a hot zone. The world is a very complex thing. I am really tough with my students. I think many of them are very lazy. And to be an entrepreneur is hard, bloody work. You really have to know a domain. And the spark is, I think the students are a big creative pool. They don't know much about innovation, because they haven't got a whole lot about life experience, but they certainly are creative. And as I ponder this, this is what entrepreneurs deal with, isn't it? Novelty, new stuff. Now, do people like new stuff? Some do. Some don't. Actually, neophobes don't. And as you tend to get older, you may become more neophobic. But I think young people are actually neophilic. They love new stuff. And the dialogue I've had at Alto a lot is my students are so active. They think the adults are so slow, so backwards, out of the game, utterly out of school for such a long time. They're worthless. They're totally naive in this. And they think the world should be acting fast. That's a, that's a neophile. Somebody who said, this is, this is the natural way in order. And who are they trying to sell to? Somebody who's neophobic. Yeah. <laughs> and we're going to come back to this. This challenge is probably the single reason why most of my student entrepreneurs fail to create a high growth business as their first gig out of school. So I'm, I'm, I'm actually rather rough with them. It's my kind of parental instinct. The way, and I'm going to show you a piece of research that backs up my hunch a lot. This is from a guy named Roger Martin, somebody you, some of you may know. He wrote a book called The Design of Business. He was the dean of the Rotman Management School. He quit. Uh, really interesting guy. He was asked to do a keynote speech, what can the design world learn from the world of business? He said, actually, there's a lot that the business world can learn from the world of design. And in this knowledge funnel, he says the world is a very mysterious place. That's where researchers love to hang out. That's big data. And 
the world is also full of algorithms, strategies, routines. Universities have routines. Companies have routines. There's nothing like having a routine that gets you the highest ranking for this university repeatable. There's nothing that a company wants more than an algorithm that pays money over the long term. Sustainable strategy. The interesting bit is this thing in the middle called heuristics, these pattern spotters. They look at the noise and say there's a new arrangement that could create a new routine. And they realize that some of these people who create routines find it very difficult to go back and look at the problem afresh and to create something new. And so there's this very tense space in the middle called heuristics, and that's exactly where you find entrepreneurs. Pattern spotters. They, many people get this big data problem, they say there's so much data I can't act, and the answer is another study, well become a professor. And there's other people inside companies, and I do a lot of company-related work, who basically say, who are you, a new graduate, to question me, the CEO, that my strategy might be out of date? And so there's a lot of barriers from routine holders. Entrepreneurs love this space, and they navigate between these two zones effortlessly. Mm. And, and, it's, and it's, it's this kind of mental skill, the more you practice this, and this is where designers, this is where their focus is trying to figure out what the heck's going on? How is that customer feeling? And it's all about observing and playing with possibilities before you figure out what's the answer. And I think too often in particularly science and business school we focus too much down here and not enough about pattern spotting. And I didn't say this at lunch, I'm doing the best teaching in my life right now and it's because of 20 years of accumulated experience that I've spotted patterns. And it's from that kind of well of experience, life experience, you get ideas popping out everywhere and how the combinations might fit and how you might tell somebody who's working with an algorithm that maybe you need to do a creative leap <coughs> and come back up here, which I do a lot of corporate work with, and then try and bring it back here. I'm navigating around this space, and the easiest line to do this is sometimes a new business. This is our game. These are the words I hear from investors and entrepreneurs all the time. I see an opportunity. I sense the customers in pain. I believe that I have the skills to make this happen, and I feel that the time is right to act. Is this analytical at all? This is feeling. This is something, particularly MBAs, no, 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 give me the roadmap. <laughs> Gut feeling. And I've heard this, and, and typically from the investment community side, and I remember some guy from London telling me, he can smell an entrepreneur in 30 seconds. We were sitting at dinner and I asked him, what's the smell? Because if, if that's a cologne I can put on, or a perfume, I'll be, if I can sell that, he said, nobody's ever asked me this. That's a really interesting question. I said, what were the bad experiences you had? I had a bad feeling. And I invested despite the bad feeling. So what caused the bad feeling? Was it an age difference? Capability? What Messaging? Timing? What? This is all intuition working in this journey. It's using this side of our brain. And this is, this is the natural spot where you find designers. Designers would love space like this. Doesn't look like a lecture hall at all. If you ask designers to do prototyping, they would love space like this. There's stuff that I could borrow, beg, borrow, and steal. They start building things. They start playing, laughing, having fun. They love to explore possibilities, and they work with the mindset that I want to find something that is a valid solution. What's a valid solution? This could work. Where's the proof? Don't know till we try. So who's more creative? These people. But. The work I do with designers is the single reason they have me come into design school is the designers find trouble transitioning from play to purpose. And engineers want to get to purpose and they think the designers are wasting time playing. I'm a firm believer you have to play and be able to decide what you do. And I try and train my students to be in the middle. I hate the word design thinking. I prefer design doing. If I'm de dealing with a person who's much more intuitive, I'm giving 
a touchy-feely kind of sales pitch versus if I have a boss who's an MBA and who wants the facts, then you need to go find the proof. But good entrepreneurs are be able to blend. They use creativity to open up possibilities, and then at some point you have to make a choice. Now, I don't know how many of you have seen this paper or know of this lady. Uh, she's a great friend. We became instantly the best friends. Best way to describe Saras? Well, um, a little bit about her background. Uh, Indian entrepreneur. Her PhD supervisor has a Nobel laureate in economics. Herbert Simon. Ooh, who did his work on the science of the artificial. Now let's just stop there. Science of artificial, an idea in my head offering to a marketplace, I see an interesting parallel. And that's a design challenge. And this paper, which I'll, I'll share with you, because the handwriting is a PDF, so I'll share it among friends. Vinod Kosla, founder of Sun Microsystems, one of the most prominent venture capitalists in Silicon Valley. First good paper I've seen. You want to read the paper because there's a two by two, two by two diagram. And he said, yes, typical MBA two by two quadrant bullshit. <laughs> paper was rejected. Four years later, accepted. Which probably tells you she came up with a radical finding, as we were talking about some interesting, this is her PhD work. And the design was basically this. She went and talked to, I believe it was 27 expert entrepreneurs who had a whole bunch of experience starting numerous ventures. Have experienced at least one huge success and one failure. Gave them all a common opportunity and said, I put this on the table. I'd like you to help talk this through how you would e exploit it. Tape recorder, talk. And what she found was exactly the opposite of the way we were teaching. Now you can well imagine how professors of entrepreneurship felt when this PhD student is challenging the exact way we're teaching. But remember what I said, expert entrepreneur. Older, hugely experienced. And she is the theoretician for the way I teach. I said, this makes sense to me. I use the word effectuation everywhere. That's the theory that, under, that grounds my teaching. And what she found was this. Everybody, and I'll make sure I share that PDF with you, every person in this room has a unique lens through which they look at opportunity. Hmm, makes sense? This is like economists telling you what's the economy doing. You're going to get as many different opinions as you have economists in the room. It, and this is called means. So it's a highly individual perspective of an opportunity, which is one of the big challenges of entrepreneurship education. You've got 100 students in the class. You show them a, a shiny object. You're going to get 100 completely different interpretations. And this is the means you look, this is the lens you look through. What are you passionate about? What are you good at? And who do you know? Now, these variables change. Now, I do a lot of work with undergrads. First year undergrad students come in with deer in the headlight looks when they come into my office. I met one yesterday at Wollongong. I don't know what to do. I hear this all the time. I said, you're a first year student? My metric for a first year successful student, are you in the right program? Yes. Good. Second year, what are you, an engineer? You got to make sure you're a damn good engineer. Then start working in domains to figure out what you're really good at. And he said, well, what if I want to be an entrepreneur? Well, you have to understand the difference about working inside an established business and working in a new venture. It's a completely different thing. But have a look. You've got to figure out what you're passionate about. And many of my students are pretty lame about this. They say they're passionate about changing the world. What does that mean, right. specifically? What part of the world do you want to change? What are you good at? What opportunity leverages the best out of you? And then networks is not Facebook. The networks that matter are the weak tie, the person you do not know that needs to know you. And I look at the networks. I do networking training for every incoming student in the School of Science. I'm going to do this at Newcastle uh, next week. The dean has me do this as part of the work. And actually, university is a networking environment. And entrepreneurs are master networkers. But most of the highly successful businesses and entrepreneurs I've dealt with, there has usually been somebody called a weak tie 
who becomes a suddenly a strong tie, and that's the key to get things going. And these things develop over time. Now, I want to introduce you to one of my students. His name's Kale. This guy, thank goodness, he finally got his undergrad degree. He um, sipped his first cup of coffee at age 14, got hooked. He is the ninth ranked barista in the world, the top barista in the Nordic region for three years running, and he is seriously into coffee. And I will bring him into class talking, and his passion just exudes. He also looks like somebody famous. He looks like Bill Gates with better hair. <laughs> 26 years old, he wants to do something in coffee. This is a journey that excites him. He gets enthused about it, can't stop talking about it, is obsessive. That's usually a very good sign you've got an entrepreneurial opportunity that is resonating with you. He told me when he was in, in my office he wanted to be the Jamie Oliver of coffee. Uh, he actually started a business based in Silicon Valley called Sudden Coffee, his mission in life now to make the world's best instant coffee. Now, I don't like instant coffee at all. I have a cappuccino machine in my office. I said, yuck, instant. He said, no, no, Peter, when I send you a sample of this stuff, this cappuccino will be the best cappuccino you've ever had in granules. If he gets this right, and it might, you can imagine what advice when he came to my office. He said, I'd like to go to the US. And I said, actually, you should go to Seattle. Because if you're close to Starbucks, Starbucks will probably buy you. He said, no, 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 Silicon Valley is more sexy. So he's in Silicon Valley. Guess who his investors were? Coffee snobs. Guess how they did the deal? Over a cup of coffee. And he keeps, it's a seduction exercise, and he's actually very good, and it actually helps that your bona fide is you're the ninth best barista in the world. And a heck of a nice guy. So the advice I give to young students, you got to find your coffee bean. Now, he started his journey at 14. Most designers actually show a portfolio when they go into school. And many of them have, this is part of their application process. You go through and say, you've been showing work. You've actually developed prototypes. You've been doing this for 10 years. And now you're an undergrad student coming to the School of Design. That's fabulous. Why don't entrepreneurs do the same thing? A portfolio of things that you have actually done. So first step, it starts with you. Second, second step. This, sorry, this passion, skills, and networks has a life experience factor into it. I've suddenly discovered, actually, that 25-year-old students do not, cannot, usually, do a high-growth business as the immediate first thing out of school. And there's probably a reason for that. And I want to share a piece of research, which I'll also share with you, that came out in 2018. This uh, professor from MIT and his research group actually looked at all the startups in the United States between 2007 and 2014, the average age of the founder. Are you interested by a pattern on this slide? The most successful businesses, the average age of the founder at founding was 45 years old. Now, yesterday, there was a lot of young students in the audience, and they went, oh my god, I'm 23. But this is not zero. But the inflection point, there seems to be a sweet zone in your late 20s and early 30s when you're rising quite high. And one thing that I ponder is that this life experience seems to lend credibility for you as an entrepreneur to go credibly ask customers for money and investors for investment. And that's a pretty tough challenge if you're 25 years old. That's my tough love message for young students. Uh, and part of the design is my president thinks I can actually train. It's just a question of training in the classroom through a course, and a 25-year-old will start a high-growth business. And I said, excuse me, in all due respect, no. And now I have a piece of research to actually say to her, I think I'm right. I'm not surprised by this curve. And in fact, I'm asking this question, how do you engage people this old in an experience with 20-somethings? I think this could be something you want to experiment on here. This is part of the reason why I'm here. This is part of the conversation I'm having with SSE. A very radical idea. Why do we design education where the cohort is all the same age? If what you want at the end is high growth business. Think about it. Think about it. It's a radical idea. 
I was mentioning over lunch, this is a great book. And I'll add to my list, I'll promise to send you, John Mullins is a very good friend from London Business School. And he came to Alto and did a presentation about this book, and the audience was very interesting. There were some very experienced people on one side of the audience and young students on the other side of the audience. And we were having coffee before his speech, and this book is saying, you know, the best money you could raise is from a customer. And little secret, professional investors are not going to back you until you actually have a customer. So the first order of business is to find and secure a customer. And then the question that follows is, what does a credible proponent look like in the eyes of a customer? And my experience with my hunch, my strong hunch is, a 23, 24, 25 year old comes across as somebody who's very creative, very engaging, nice conversation, but I'm sitting there wondering as the customer, so are you going to be around in a year? Do you really know what you're doing? You're making promises to me, can you keep them? And I think part of the answer of why these top funders are in their 30s and 40s is these people have life experience actually securing customers. They know exactly who these people are and how to seduce them and get the deal. Second principle, affordable loss. What are you prepared to lose? This is not what students want to hear. Don't give me the hockey stick. Tell me what's the hypothesis you need to test fast and cheap, and this is where experimentation and prototyping comes into play. Let's think about this as university educators. As scientists, we're very good at this. But curriculum committees are not good at this. They want the prototype. No. No, no, no. They want, they want, when I propose a course, I've just been through this exercise at Alto, I had to lock down a two-year plan. So I'm not sure it's the prototype for the, you're basically calling me plan A. Well, plan A never works. Prototypes are to find something that could work. And it rarely is the first time around. And this is another area where I think SSE could help to explore prototypes. What's your hypothesis? Test it out, refine, revise, and after a few iterations, you're onto something great. But our curriculum committees, that's not the way they operate. They're more analytical types. They need plan A. I drive, I drive curriculum committees crazy at times. But my boss likes that I actually drive the curriculum committee crazy at times. And I was mentioning this at lunch uh, about a PhD subject around failure. This is the number of prototypes before this person hit upon the idea. 15 years, 5,127 prototypes that James Dyson invented the vacuum cleaner. Now, most of my students would say, one failure, I'm out. And by the way, interesting guy, he thinks universities suck. This should be a place where people experiment and failure and learn. And taking failure and saying to a student, it's not an F on your transcript, it's an experience from which you learn. If you read very carefully Jeff Bezos' approach to Amazon, that's exactly what he is doing. Make 100 bets, you lose 98 times. And too often, researchers and policymakers focus on identifying the two fruitlessly. But to get the two, you have to invest in 100. And then if it's one of the 98 that didn't quite work out, you don't punish the person who actually wanted to try. But you do want to decode, what did you learn from this? This is a great product, by the way, in design. He, event he went to the vacuum cleaner manufacturers to sell it. At an early stage, they all said no, because they make money off of vacuum cleaner bags. Uh, it's like a power tool, so men like to use this. So ladies, men vacuuming at home. Bonus. And this immediate feedback that when you run it over a surface, you immediately see the dirt. This guy is the Apple. He's the equivalent Apple in consumer goods. He's worth, last time I checked, six or seven billion pounds. He's fascinated by this intersection of design and engineering, and he would like to see schools take more risks. Risks. This is something, it's a big agenda item. So experiments. So personal lens, experimentation, third step, co-creation. Co. Co. Now, I was just in Stockholm a couple of weeks ago, and I have to say I was appalled by the attitude of some of the professors. 
this man from Yotabury sitting at the back of the room said, oh, the student is not my customer. I am the PhD expert. The student is sitting in the chair to listen to me. I never set myself up like that. I learn more from my students than they learn from me. I'm more a mentor than I am a faculty member. I insist they don't call me professor. I never give them a roadmap, and we co-create ideas together. And they love it. I'm not doing the work for them, but they suddenly realize you have to share, shape, and figure out who needs to help and how do I get these people to help. That's a sales pitch. And you have to have the confidence to know that I need help, which means most professors don't fit this mold. If they come in and say, I own the IP, I need no help, you listen to me, I'm the expert, I have a PhD, that typically you can't do anything because they're not in co-mode. Companies are starting to get this. Now, this is one of my students, Maya. Really nice designer, and she was working in our design factory, which you could talk about. It, the design factory has got to shape something like this. And she was interested in doing something in mobile charging, and Finns like to replace mobile phones a lot, so she had a drawer of all this nasty material from all of these incompatible powering devices. That was her opportunity. Hmm. It was her opportunity until Nokia announced we are with other manufacturers developing a common plug. Mm. But she was interested in the area of mobile charging, so she set up a company called PowerKiss. Pink female entrepreneur, proud of it. Wonderful. How'd you come up with the name? It was available. And what's the story behind the name? When her husband kissed her in the morning, her energy level rose. As she was genuinely one of these sharing, nice people. It's one of my litmus tests when I want to work with people. This is like a sharing experience. I came to Sydney early because Nick's a friend, and this is the way you do positive networking, and it, you, you pay it forward and it comes back in spades, always. And she said, can I meet you and talk about this? I said, sure. Uh, and literally, true story, I'm going to New York. When I get back from New York, uh, we're going to come and meet. Now, a little secret about being a designer, you've all got a mobile phone in your pocket, this is the best thing if you slow down and watch. The world tells you everything you need to know. I got out of New York City, Kennedy Airport, Terminal 8, and this is the sign I saw. And remember, I just had this conversation with Maya, and she said she's into mobile charging, and I better, I said, I better take a picture. Took a picture, went back to my hotel room, had a moment, did some background research, and what if I were to tell you PowerMat is a venture capital-backed company, company the claim of the company is if you put the phone on one of their mobile surfaces, power surfaces, it charges faster than if you plug the phone on the wall. Ooh. And it's raised a lot of money in Silicon Valley. How would you react as a Finnish entrepreneur? She went, there's no opportunity. I said, yes, there is. They've just demonstrated to you mobile charging is an interesting space. I'd like you to talk to your IP lawyer, understand their IP, and make sure that yours is different. And then you're going to wave this little bit of information to the local investors to see if you can get some interest. She walked out with a boost of confidence. Uh, she went to a furniture fair, met a couple of people. These people are big into office furniture. These people are big into, in, into house furniture. The Finnish government had a very interesting program when big, big companies could work with entrepreneurs on joint projects. They do joint development grants. What are you in? Mobile charging. What are you guys in? Furniture. Oh, why don't we work together? Long story short, they decided to electrify the table, drill a hole in the table, put this toggle into the phone, lay it on the table, and it would start charging. Government said, good idea, we'll give you a million euro development grant. Now, these two liked her. I asked the question, would a furniture manufacturer say the interesting space is to electrify the table? No. Would somebody who's in the mobile charging say the solution to the problem is drill a hole in a table? No. They liked her. They had, oh, this could be interesting and neat. The government's going to help bring us together. Story gets better. Power Mac calls. We're going to buy your company. And as public information in Finland, 36 years old, this student made a capital gain of 600,000 euros. Power Mat itself is in a joint venture with a small company named Procter & Gamble and Duracell Batteries. So there's something to this 
interplay between big companies. I love to work creative challenges with big companies because those are the nuggets that entrepreneurs do de-risks for. And it's brilliant. And if you play the game right, the company who wanted the de-risk done is the big company is usually the person who buys you back out. That is a pattern that pays money. It's very reliable, but you need to get into these companies to figure out what their creative challenges are. That's where I think there's some very big space. She's now started a second company. She sold it to a trade buyer. She's looking for a third company now. She's not even 40 years old. Heck, heck, heck of a nice lady. Surprise, what's the insight you didn't know? Now, I puzzle about this. My students are never going to be surprised if they're sitting in the same room all the time, working in the same teams with the same people. You're in a comfort zone. You're not into a creative zone at all. And I want to introduce you to this concept because this came from a guy I met in Sweden. Picture a youth hostel. Now, this audience is a bit more experienced, not older. A bit more experienced. Probably been a long time since you've been in one of these. I was doing a guest lecture at KTH in Stockholm, and our guest had operated a youth hostel. And this is the kind of picture you get, right? Bunk beds, yeah. bed bugs, no security, there's no concierge, there's no restaurant. And it, it's backpackers, and it's cheap. Well, this Swedish guy is named Oscar Dios. He came to class. It was a high-growth entrepreneurship class, and the Swedish students were all listening and said, why the heck is a guy that's a youth hostel operator coming in here to talk to a high-growth entrepreneurship class? Well, let me tell you about Oscar. He went to Arlanda Airport in Stockholm asking the Swedish airport, I'd like to set up a youth hostel at this airport. And uh, you, know, you know only too well. It's a very fancy airport with hardwood floors. No, 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 no. We do not want these you know, cheap students and youth hostel hanging around the airport. And by the way, there's a hotel right here in Sky City which solves this problem, 250 euros a night. He kept pounding back and getting rejection. And uh, he suddenly went to a bar one night and met a guy, had a beer, and they got into a conversation. And this guy said, you know, I had a good idea. I wanted to take this bankrupt plane, which is parked out here, has been for six years, and move it to one of these gates and open up a bar. Which, by the way, is a brilliant idea. It would never, ever work in Sydney because there's not enough gates. It would never work in Heathrow. The economics would not work. But a little thing about domain knowledge of Stockholm, there's a climate control carbon footprint crowd over the Arlanda commune, which means this airport is capped at 40% capacity. What plane? Well, the plane is parked out here. It's not fit to fly. Long story short, he decided to cut the fence down, negotiate the parking fence, cut the fence down, put the fence back up, and outfit the 747 jet as a youth hostel. Like the the, the the yep. Now who in any class would ever think that this is, you know, a youth hostel is a piece of property? And by the way, he spent two million euros on this. And that's the honeymoon suite. <laughs> and it's busy and it's packed. And the students were sitting here like this listening and, and I was looking at Oscar in the front row. I said, Oscar, when you went to them with this plan, what did they, he said they laughed. They thought this was a crazy idea. Why not? From a surprise conversation you had in a bar with an open mind. Two million is probably a hell of a lot cheaper than actually building a brick and mortar youth hostel. But you would never know unless you get out and are open to these chance encounters. Gets better. He was on CNN. A low-cost airline called him up and said, we saw you, cr you're the crazy nut that's got this uh, 747 jet as a youth hostel. We dump passengers at airports that have nothing. How would you like to go to the boneyard and buy a fleet of jets to set up a chain of youth hostels? That's good. It's the reaction I expected. Smiles on your face going, wow, this is really unusual. That's a highly creative solution. They're still talking about it. But it's an embracing surprise. And I design for surprise. And if you're in the classroom all the time, you are likely never, ever going to be surprised. If you are working with the same discipline all the time, you are not ever, ever, ever going to be surprised. So I really like to see different nationalities 
a mixture of disciplines in the same room. I give out unstructured challenges and I let them throw them in the pool and let's see what happens. And it's brilliant. We move from analytics, we start with intuitives, and if you mix these two and keep practicing, you become very good design doers. The pitch I give to my students is, I think I'm in the business of honing your entrepreneurial skills. They get jobs. Most of my students, and I have long 30,000 students in the 25 years I've been teaching, 27 countries, there seems to be an obvious pattern. Graduates, five to seven years after you graduate, you come back to my office and you explain to me about the boss who doesn't get the project that you think is highly creative in your organization. Then I got something to work with. People who go out of the gate with expectations they could do a high growth business is the first thing you do out of a graduation, typically don't have staying power. So I think my design variables for education is, and this is one I'm, I'm pondering about. If this is a personal voyage, <laughs> then how could you touch every student in SSE about this process? Not like this. Because it drives me crazy. I have limited, I have high demand for places in my class, and yet people who should really be there get bumped out. And there are people in there saying, oh, that was interesting and neat and fun, but I don't want to do this. I felt like, oh, there's a wasted opportunity. And I think Nick and I have been talking about this. I think there's an immense space to start to partition the, re the, the very uh, heavy, uh, how do I put this? How do I allocate the scarce supply of seats to people who've got some base knowledge of that, you know, this is a route I want to try. I, I, I have some kind of knowledge about what the process is involved and I've started to think about my journey before I come to class. In fact, this is something we could do with bachelor students. If they're building the network, and I, I see them five years down the track, I think the product at the end of five years of a hunch is going to be a lot better than having them come in at the beginning of class and say, by the way, in uh, six weeks you're going to produce an idea. They're pretty lame. It's so, so artificial. I think this is something I really like to think we could talk about. How do we design this personal journey? Could be for employees, alums, students. as a kind of entry gate to get into a high-touch expensive experience like this to make sure you're allocating to people who really have the desire, the knowledge, and a bit of the caveat emptor before they walk into the class. And I've been thinking about it. It's all about discovering passion. Young people, they don't really know sometimes. It's part of the benefit of traveling and meeting lots of people and sharing experiences. I have a passion for this. This isn't work to me. I get paid for it. This is great double bonus, how to hone your skills, how to build your network. Very tactical things, and this develops over time. How do you develop these hypotheses quickly and cheaply? Do you have course experiences that actually this is the outcome? Now, I can say when I look around a, a building like this, we have a 10-month, uh, sorry, a 9-month experience commission projects with companies. Students in teams of 10 get a brief from a company in nine months, they have to develop a prototype. Now in Alto, we charge them 20,000 euros per project and we have companies lining up for these projects. The students are great. 10 months is a long time. I think one interesting area that I'd like to start to investigate is doing what I would call um, ideation sprints of two or three days with companies. Here's some creative students. Here's a company with a creative challenge have people from the company and the students working together. The students have got very disruptive behavioral traits. They're trying to disrupt banking gain, for example. And the bankers are sitting there saying, uh, we really need some creativity. And this could be an opportunity to create a forum where there's potential employees in that room. Companies want people who have this mentality. How can I test stuff out quickly and cheaply? And by the way, big companies find this very difficult to do. They throw lots of money at this and, and do bugger all with it. I could coin a new term. I hear lean, lean startup. This is lean, iteration is lean. Cheap, fast, lean. But if you think about it, and you look at the mirror of university, we don't do things in a lean style at all. And we do things with very complicated structures and spend lots of resources 
and the mainstream of the business is this very big bureaucratic routine operation. Now I could share with you off a of video. I, I'm a little nonconformist in a corner. I think universities should have such a corner. And, and I respect what goes on in the university as a routine. I'm in the business of trying to help the university find new routines. That's a different kind of personality trait. It's a different kind of task, but it's something that we need to start to embrace. It's part of the reason why I think SSE has been created. Engaging others to shape opportunity. Students get this, companies don't. Professors sometimes don't get this because they walk in sometimes and say, I'm the expert, you are the person who doesn't know nearly as much, so I know, you don't, I say, you listen. That's not a co-creation, engagement, shaping concept. And some of my Asian students find it very difficult. They want the road map to get an A, and I say, well, you're gonna find, I'm going to try and help you find a good idea, but you've got to discover it. And it, the learning is from the discovery process, and you're going to find it frustrating. I hear this game disrupting a lot. In our university, we, we, the, the PR people now say it's a university of game disruptors. Yeah. What does that mean? What does that actually mean? And in fact, if somebody tells me this, I want to know what you know about the game. You want to disrupt the game of banking? Tell me where you've worked in a bank. I haven't. You better work in a bank to actually credibly tell me you want to disrupt the game. You've got to know something intimately about the game to disrupt it. And I think that's where good heuristics come from. I, I do two sets of audiences. One audience, graduate students. The other audience, executives. The executive MBAs take an elective with me. Their average age is 35 and above. The more interesting conversations I have with the 35 and above people are about the bosses who have the project that they say no to. They have credibility. They need a bit more creativity. I'd love to be able to mix these two groups. I see a huge development space. And if, if that piece of research is right, I ask this question of my 23-year-old student sitting there. Look at this, this research. And their jaws sort of dropped. They said, so how do you become more credible? And they were twiddling their thumbs. I said, it's actually quite easy. You have to bring in a little more gray hair. And as you do, the age curve starts to increase. But yet we've designed education to keep these two groups separate. We leave alums to go out and we pip them up for money. When in fact, many of them are not only sources of contacts and building networks and sales leads, these are also many people who might want to transition and join a team and do something new. What's in there for them? I, I see very few schools actually thinking about these cross-generational designs. I'll share with you that piece of research, but I think this is, and I, if you get the impression, I love to rapidly prototype, and I, and I know how to play the university game. I have carved out certain credits in the program that I'm the master of. I can do whatever I want in those courses as long as I can make a pedagogical argument. But you know, there's a committee that's talking about pedagogy. To me, pedagogy is, does the stuff work? And my intuition tells me it does, but I know I have to develop some metrics on that over time. I, I love making people feel uncomfortable. And my students, they find it tough. They find my approach a lot of tough love, but they learn how to tell a very good story. They get to prototype presentations, and they have to get to the point. And often, I will do this with an unstructured challenge that I do across courses. So what I have these double dippers who take many courses with me. They're working on the same challenge, but I don't want to see the same presentation. This year, we're going to talk about rethinking the concept of banking. One of the ideas I'll share with you, as long as you don't put this on the internet and they can see, one of the ideas I'm most interested in having them look at, in Finland, we have among the lowest cash in circulation of any economy in the world, digi banking. My mother-in-law, who is 87, does not know, oh, she doesn't want to hear about ATM cards. She has never been on the internet. She has never done an email, and she wants cash. And the banks in our town, there is no bank that carries cash anymore. How does the digi person explain to an 87-year-old that the bank has no currency? This I say to a bank executive who's in my executive MBA. Have you ever thought about designing a senior citizen's bank, but you wouldn't call it a senior citizen's bank? Someplace comfortable, 
where a person could get cash, could have a conversation, and think about staffing it with recent retirees of the bank. And by the way, the service that is needed in there is something that would be very clever to design estate planning, provided that the bank would make money off the deposit base. Banker told me, that's a really good project. Now you can well imagine if you were thinking about one of these things about reinventing banking, and somebody said, that's our idea, a senior citizen's bank. Well, the bank would say, I'd love to hire you. Would you like to help us try and figure out how to do this in our bank? And that's where my students can learn about the difficulties of doing the innovation bit. They love the creativity bit, but until you actually figure out how damn difficult innovation is in practice, and when you get that life experience doing that, then suddenly you've got this kind of perspective that you could actually take on high growth business as an option. I mentioned portfolios. I'm a big fan of the Art Center. This is the kind of visuals that design students do. I'd love to be able in time for an entrepreneur to show me what you've done. A lot of my students come to me with their CVs. It shows you how good you are. The most interesting thing in the CVs is, yes, you have to tell about the education. What's the most interesting thing you did in school? Do you have a link to the portfolio? Have you actually built something? I have students who say, I'm very creative, so what have you created? Boom, boom, boom. I'm very entrepreneurial, so what have you done? Boom, 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 boom. I'm a natural born leader, so what have you led? And when you fashion that kind of argument that it's a portfolio of activities that you've done and need to develop, and you can do this in a highly visual way, this is an, a really engaging story for people who want to work with you. I want you to think about lemonade. Somebody in the European Union has this slide. Now, in America, lemonade stands is what kids do. Uh, Gabby's in the, in the lemonade business. You have a recipe to create some lemonade. You have to create a pop-up stand. You need to know something about accounting to figure out pricing. You need to get startup capital from your parents. So schools are very good at the mechanics of how to put up a lemonade stand. If I understand the money on a lemonade stand, this is a good thing. This is what I mean by business planning. I want to cut to the chase. So what are you selling and how much is it worth doing? Where are you going to put it? Traffic? You got a good smile? Hmm? It wouldn't work in Finland because it's too damn cold. It would work in hot climates. Oh, I get that. And now she wants to do a Starbucks. That's the big business. But if Gabby really wants to do a Starbucks, you know what I want to see in her resume? Have you worked at Starbucks? Do you know how Starbucks operates? How do they make decisions about locations? <coughs> Failing that kind of experience, I wouldn't give you the money to do a Starbucks. Get the point? Yep. I think students are very good at businesses like this. Micro little businesses. And you know, in tough life, if somebody really wants to be an entrepreneur and they're young, find an opportunity that doesn't require a lot of cash and hit up your, your family for money. Perfectly good thing. But if it's high growth you want, you want to go raise money, it's a real tough game and the bar is a lot higher. If you really want to do this, the bar is a lot higher. And you have to think about the kind of experience to get somebody to buy in. I want to tell you in part this kid. There's a video clip in this presentation. I encourage you to look at it. It's brilliant. Despite what we said about 45-year-olds, this kid is Jake. He's age 10. A little word about Jake. Age 8, he went to his father and he said, Dad, I'd like to get a Star Wars Lego set, 400 bucks. Father said, no way. You want it, you pay for it. Eight-year-old kid, Dad, how the heck? I'm a young kid, how do I get 400 bucks to pay for this? Well, if you want to bounce some ideas off me, I'll help you. And so he saw this article about, he saw this article about a lemonade stand. He said, I'll, I'll, I'll set up a lemonade stand. What do you think about that, Dad? And so the father helped him design a portable stand that he could put at the farmer's market. First year, 2,000 in sales, $900 profit, age eight. Age nine, there's a thing called the Young Americans Bank that gives loans to young kids. Adults are not allowed to sign. Goes to the bank and said, I'd like a $5,000 loan, please. And the business plan is this. I made 900 bucks on my first stand. I'd like to hire three more kids so we have a franchise of four and I'm going to give the kids a wage and a cut of the profits. Age 9. Age 10, this kid raised 50 grand on Shark Tank. And he's a black belt in karate, he's a hell of a nice kid. This kid's going to have no trouble getting into school. <laughs> Harvard will be all over him to have them in the class. So I do think we can inspire the young. 
this is a natural born sales salesman. But you know, the Finnish people are always, young Americans bank, young kids? I think that's a great business opportunity for a bank. It's a very different logic. I, I uh, saved you the red pants because I do, I do teaching in the kitchen. That's the one thing I'm known for. I teach that effectual framework in a kitchen as opposed to a lecture. And it's the single most important thing the MBAs tell me. And I met a guy on my flight to Santiago. He was sitting next to me in Madrid and he said, do you remember me? No, I was in your class seven years ago. Oh. He said, you know what? That strawberry challenge exercise you did in the kitchen, that's the only thing I remembered out of my entire MBA. And I said, what did you learn? And over a glass of champagne in business class, he told me. And I went, wow, sticky. So I'll be happy to share that with you. If I come back to Sydney, I'd be happy to do some kind of forum with some entrepreneurs. Because there's something about this exercise that kind of breaks them all. We don't teach this way anymore. I couldn't teach that way at Stanford. I could at Altho. So I'm, ha I'm in a very happy place that I can do some experiments. And I hope that I can share some of that experience of doing this experiment. It's a tough journey. But I think we need to get started on it. Okay. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. Guys.